So hello, today we're at St Stephen's Church in Great Wigborough and we're going to look at the history of the church and the village itself. So Great Wigborough is a village in Essex. It's two miles from Peldon and four miles from Tol St Darcy. Now the village is surrounded by Essex farmland and the elevation here is around 24 metres or 70 old feet in old money. Now today's population is around 180. Great Wigborough is an ancient place. Its name in Saxon suggests a battle fortification stood here once on the high ground where villagers took refuge from invading pirates or Vikings. Near to St Stephen's a tumulus was found where the battle dead were buried Wigborough means wicker's barrow. There is so much we don't know. Wigborough and the Saxons. Now before 1066 there was five Saxon manors here and the capital manor here was owned by Barking Abbey. Now we know that the abbess was called Ab Afgiva and she would have visited here by boat or by horse, we cannot be sure. But every year Afgiva, with her sergeant at arms, would come here to collect the tithe barn rents. Now if you think that one tenth of all the money collected would go towards the church, then Barking Abbey was one of the wealthiest in the country. The Saltings and Red Hills. We have made our way from Great Wigborough's Hill, for we overlook the lowlands of the Saltings of the Blackwater Estuary and the Saltcock Creek. Now if we turn around in the distance, you just make out the hill. Today is an absolutely super day. The temperature is running around 30 degrees, even down here. Now, Abbas Avgiva owned six horse, ha so, sorry, six salt houses here. The rich salty water was boiled on clay pans, leaving salt flakes. Wigborough's Henge. Essex, I've discovered, has its very own henge. We've all heard of Stonehenge with its stone circle in Salisbury. Well, Wigborough has its very own henge right here where I stand. Now, if I pan around, it's very hard to make out apart from 
in the air, but it's roughly around here. Now a hinge is basically a bank and ditch dug in a circular formation. This one measures 46 metres or 150 feet across and it, it's actually got two entrances. Now we don't actually know why they were built but it's believed a hinge was a ceremonial space and meeting place. So you have to trust me that it's there somewhere. Now if we look back over and we look between the two trees, a short distance beyond, about 500 metres, lays Verley's Hinge, so I believe there must be some sort of connection. Now the best part, Great Wigborough's Henge actually predates Stonehenge. It's perhaps 5,000 years old. It's just here. Can you see the hole? I believe it's a woodpecker's home. It's like this old tree's met its end. So now we are going to look at the old hall. She's just over here. Abbot's Hall. We stand just one mile from St Stephen's Church. This was once the manor belonging to Abbess of Giva of Barkin Abbey. And they would hold on to it until 1540 and the dissolution of the monasteries. Now Henry VIII would then grant Abbot's Hall to Thomas Cromwell, the same man that has instigated the dissolution of the monasteries, and helped King Henry get rid of Anne Boleyn. In April of 1540 Cromwell was made Earl of Essex. In July he was then executed for treason, heresy and corruption. Today Abbots Hall is the head office of the Essex Wildlife Trust and its grounds are a nature reserve. We can see how the Sawcock Creek wraps itself around this state. And if we look at this map, this is the main road. You come in, there's the hall itself where we're standing now. If you walk past the hall and take this path, follow it till you've got a bend. And here is Big Burr Henge. The 
great Wigborough sign. Well, we can see three shields to the left. St Stephen the Martyr showing the stones that killed him. The centre shows the shield of Barking Abbey. And to the right, the Bullock family of Great Wigborough. Pass through Great Wigborough today, you will find no pub. But once this fine building was known as the Old King's Head. It's positioned right on the Malden Road. The junction behind me heads off to Colchester. Now we know it was a pub since the 17th century and closed its doors in 1981. Today it's a private residence. A jolly old song was written in the 1930s and some of the lyrics went like this We are the boys of Wigborough Shire We can drink quarts and quarts of beer So if you want a happy night out come and join the King's Head crew So roll up lads and lasses You're as welcome as the flower in May The rain comes down but we don't care We're far too busy knocking back the beer Great Wigborough Martyrs. In the time of Queen Mary, two local farmers, John Simpson and John Ardley, were put to death for refusing to give up their Protestant faith. Both Johns were burned to death in nearby Rochford and Rayleigh. And perhaps they farmed these very fields. So this time of year the mighty conquer tree drops its conkers on the floor. And I believe they were imported long ago from Turkey. And as children straight after school we would go to our local conquer tree and get the best ones for the conquer fights. put a hole through here and then put it on the string and the winner 
after you smash the conkers against each other, the winner will play in a tournament as such. Great Wigborough and the Earthquake of 1884. Now if I said Earthquake of 1884 and Great Wigborough it would make no sense. Well on the 22nd of April of that year a 22nd earthquake struck the villages around Colchester passing directly through Great Wigborough and off to France. Now St Stephen's Church received a direct hit from the shockwave and its west tower which we're looking at now had, to be, had a major crack in its south and west sides so bad it was more or less rebuilt. Now if we look directly ahead a foundation stone still marks the occasion. Now an extra mention must go to the good Reverend Frederick Theobald of this parish for he would fund the complete renovation or rebuilding of St Stephen's chancel and church funding £3,000 himself. Just a few miles from Great Wigborough we move to Little Wigborough and we're going to look at the site of the Zeppelin which landed in World War I. Code named L33 would make a dramatic landing across Copt Hall Lane in 1916. Hit by artillery shells over London, Capitan Alois Bocker would make a dash for the North Sea. Rapidly losing altitude, Bocker swung the giant airship around and landed right here where we stand. And if we look at this small cottage we can see the scene we would have witnessed in 1916. Can you believe that? And if you look where my thumb is, there's a guy on a ladder. The other thing to note is that they cut through the Zeppelin, through the lane where we're just going to go now and get the next picture. Isn't that incredible? Now Captain Bocker and his 21 crew would go on to torch L30, L33 right here. We've got a picture. You can see the superstructure crossing the lane. They would knock on this cottage and uh, warn the occupants to leave. Um, they were too scared to come out obviously so they torched the Zeppelin and the miraculously no harm came to the people inside. Then Captain Bocker and his 21 crew would then march on up the lane just as we do now, off towards Peldon.
now we face St Stephen's Church, set on the highest point of Great Wigborough. If you walk to the East End Gate, you will see spectacular views of the Blackwater Estuary and Mersey Island. make out in the distance we can just make out Mersey Island and the estuary. This would be from the story of Reverend Gould and Mahala in the 1800s. Now if you look at the you can just make out that hill, that is actually the island and the caravan park. Now we are going to look more closely at St Stephen's Church. What a beautiful view this is. Now the walls are made of mixed rubble and septaria with limestone dressings. Now septaria I read was actually used in Colchester Castle by the Romans. And it's basically prehistoric clay, millions of years old. If you're wondering why my hands are black it's because I was peeling black walnuts yesterday which they said could stain your hands and did I listen no so now we shall start with this magnificent 15th century porch Let's start with the outer archway. Now we can see how these shafts and moulded capital bases have heavily worn from the climate here. Okay, let's enter the porch itself. So if we look around, we have a prayer tree on the left hand side. Go on to this side, we've got some conkers. Which now are falling all over the place, so you can see them on the ground. And 
now we shall look upon the south doorway itself, which is 15th century, and the head stops are heavily worn. We can just make out some of the detail. I think at one time this would have been a very special doorway indeed. And look at this. Now we're just going to wait for the church to open. So whilst we wait, let's have a look at this excellent little booklet, uh, which is for sale for 50p. And um, it lists a walk from here to Little Wigborough's church, which is one and a half hours, and uh, goes into detail about what you'll see on the way. And then on the back, we've got another walk which goes to the Abberton Reservoir. And this is where the dam busters flew. And that's also one and a half hours. And you can find this in the porch. Okay, Chris is going to open the church. Okay, let's go inside. So I'll take my cap off and we should go inside. So now we have entered the nave which measures 37 feet by 21 feet. Now as we look up at this magnificent roof, rebuilt after the 1884 earthquake, using the original timbers. The moulded wall plates are from the 15th century and support this hammer beam roof. We see eight gilded angels with outstretched wings. Now these were presented by Reverend Theobald and his wife Jane in 1897. Okay, if we pan around we can look at the south aspect. I always like to look at the south view. And you can just see how the left hand side has got a bit of a tilt to it. Now we can see just by the side of the doorway we've got the stoop. Now this stoop uh, was used by worshippers entering by the north door and applying, sorry, I'll just check that. They did enter by the north doorway and apply holy water and make the sign of the cross. This was uncovered in the restoration works of 1893. Okay, so if we pan all the way around, we're going to look at the north doorway. So just to make you aware that the church is open uh, in the month of October, every Wednesday between 12 and 4. And Chris has kindly volunteered to keep it open. So here we have the north doorway. So this is a late 14th century doorway built either side of the Peasants' Revolt of 1381.
So here we have a beautifully carved World War I memorial made in alabaster stone. It's beautiful, isn't it? Now this lists the nine men who made the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. And this must have been a devastate, have a devastating effect on the parish because there's a very small community here. Oh, and we've got a Peter from 1940. Okay. Now, if we look between the exhibits of the Zeppelin, we have a memorial to Frederick Yates, who was a vicar here for 17 years. So Frederick served as an army padre during World War I in Malta, Gibraltar, Shanghai and Iraq. And he served in the military for 17 years. Now, St Stephen's Church is known for its fine Victorian stained glass windows and Christopher has kindly agreed to explain some detail of these windows. So we start with this one on the north wall. Yeah, so what are we looking at, Chris? Well, this is the most recent window in the church, even though it was uh, put in, uh, what, ooh, about 70, 80 years ago. Um, is by a gentleman called um, Eden, and we know that as the um, original design for this window is held by the Victorian Albert Museum. Wow. The window shows uh, three figures, faith, hope, and charity. So we have faith represented by... Um, what, uh, the very uh, top, is that? No, no, faith is oh. the bottom, on the left. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, Fides faith. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's uh, it's probably not um, Christ because uh, he's holding a um, he's holding a, a staff and a book. Um, above oh. him, there's um, a uh, a drawing of a church. Um, I'm not sure where that church is. I don't recognise it as being anywhere in the locality. Oh. It may well be the church. Of the um, the uh, vicar reverend Frederick Theobald, who this window commemorates, it may well be the church where he was uh, baptised, confirmed, oh, okay. or maybe where he was a curate. Um, right at the top light, we have uh, we have a uh, hope. Oh, this is hope itself. Yeah, that's hope, and. Interestingly, it shows a lady not in biblical clothes, but in uh, late medieval clothing, mm. um, holding a, um, a staff or holding um, a stick from which uh, leaves are sprouting and a scroll in her left hand. Uh, then on the right hand side, we have another Tudor lady representing uh, charity, um, holding a burning lamp in her right hand and a, um, I don't know, it could be a chalice or something, but, mm, with, see the, that. Yeah, but with the inscription IHS. Yeah. Again, wearing um, Tudor clothing and above her, we have um, a round all showing the pelican in her piety. Now this particular um, emblem has been uh, popular since medieval times and it shows the pelican pricking her breast uh, to make it bleed and the blood being used to feed her chicks. Oh. Um, this is a... Very symbolic. Of, yeah, symbolic of um, the blood of Christ at uh, the communion. So um, an interesting modern uh, version of that. 
Mm, thank you very much. Okay, so now we're going to look at this niche straight in front of us. So originally a statue of a saint most likely would have stood here in, the fifth, in this 15th century niche. If we look closely we can see the base where the statue would have stood. It's obviously been destroyed. And at the top, we've got a ribbed vault. Look at that. Goes off to a sort of spire at the top. So we're going to bit of a bit of a ping pong here. We're going to go back to the south wall, and there's a board showing the rectors of Great Wigborough. And you can see that somebody's gone into a great amount of effort to detail all the rectors from 1241 up to 2003. If you notice there are no pews in this church and it has a modern layout redesigned to be a meeting place for the community. Okay, if we go back to the north wall, we have the second window, which is the Captain Theobald Memorial window of 1914. So, Chris, what can you tell me about this lovely window? Well, this window is 20, um, sorry, 10 years earlier than the window uh, we've just seen by Eden. Um, it um, was made by... Um, almost certainly made by a firm called Hartman and Co who were based in Birmingham um, you can see the window is um, well in the church it looks particularly uh, dark but mm. the um, draftsmanship the skillet painting on the um, armor the faces is really quite high um, the the window is very similar to quite a lot of windows being made at the end of the 19th and the 20th century, most notably by a gentleman called Charles Kemp, who did windows in a similar style. Um, his windows are usually easily recognised by having um, a little wheat sheaf, usually in the bottom left or right corner. Uh, when Charles Kemp died in um, 1907, a relative took over uh, called Tower, and the windows really didn't change much, except that the wheat sheep now had a black tower imposed on it. So very much in the style of Kemp, um, who was selling many windows at this time. Um, rather dark and gloomy, but that said, when you get up close to it, you can see the um, skill in painting on it. It's beautiful, and it's very detailed, isn't it? Mm. Um, of course, if the whole church was glazed with glass similar mm. to this, then it really would be dark and, depending on your yeah. faith, dark and mysterious. Okay. If you're of a high One way church, of it. Or dark and gloomy if you're yeah. of the more um, evangelical wing. So there was a move away from these very dark windows to windows which contain much more white glass, which would just seem... Uh, in the case of Eden. And I made a mistake, it's not Victorian, it was around 1930, the first window. Uh, the first window was 1930s. This window commemorates um, Fred, um, Frederick George Fearbold, who died during the First World War uh, in 1914. Um, we don't know exactly when it was uh, made or put in the church, but uh, knowing the shortage of uh, uh, labour due mm. to uh, people fighting... Uh, for the country, it may well have been made um, after the First World War, um, say about 1919, 1920. Okay. Yeah. Um, it shows um, St. George on the left, uh, and you can probably, um, you might be able to make out a dragon uh, at his feet. No, I don't think there is a dragon there. It's 
very difficult seeing the red light. On the right, we I think there might um, be some wing, possibly, is it? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah. But definitely on the left, we have um, uh, St. Michael, and there you can see the dragon in purple. Yeah. Um, with, uh, it looks like the, um, oh, yes. the flag uh, pole of um, St. Michael being Yeah, uh, I can see the claw there, yeah. Yeah. Oh, right, yeah, you can just make that out, yeah. It's clear, isn't it? Mm. See the lance. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. So just beneath this magnificent window, we have the Bullock Brass Memorial Plate. So originally this plate was on the floor for Henry Bullock of 1609. Now Henry was a yeoman of Great Wigborough, only in a small estate. And he married to, he was married to Anne and they had three children. Now Henry Bullock would be buried in the chancel and would leave 30 shillings to the poor of Great Wigborough and 20 shillings to the poor of Tollesbury. The Bullock families would live here for two more centuries. Now we shall look upon this very fine pulpit. Now this was carved um, in 1898 in memory of Reverend Frederick Watson. Now, in this year, 1898, the world's first serious car crash takes place in Surrey when a Mr. Lindfield's car hits a tree. Now, if we look next to the pulpit, we have the rude staircase. And it's virtually intact. Um, this would have lead, led to the rude balcony above. And imagine during the Reformation, the rude loft and screen would have been dismantled and probably burned outside, being seen as too popery. So here we have the, uh, where it would have come out onto the balcony. Okay. Been given the all clear to have a look. Go right up. This would have been wow. Guess where the priest resistance would have come out. Look at this. Oh wow. It's a rude balcony would have come across here. Okay, we shall move around to the south wall. So this window was uh, installed post earthquake restoration time. It's got some nice patterns in it. And it was installed with the hope of possibly replacing in the future with a memorial window, but I think it's very nice myself. Now, if we look beneath, we have a memorial to Colonel Spencer Bird of 1926. So Colonel Bird served in the Boer War in South Africa. The King of England would present him with a service medal in 1902. 
1914, Colonel Byrd, now 60, would volunteer for active duty during World War I and commanded the Royal Fusiliers in France, often visiting his men in the trenches. Colonel Byrd was also a keen cricketer and was married to Mary, having two children. We now move on to a most unusual font designed in the 15th century. Now the octagonal bowl with panelled sides shows the mystic rose. Feathers joined by a scroll representing the resurrection. You can also see a series of blank charger shields and a heart with a rear scroll. Also very unusual, I've noticed these repairs. Which have been carried out at some point. So, just in front of the chancel, we have two memorials. This is dedicated to Richard Wiseman of 1616. Now, in this year, 1616. Sir Walter Raleigh is released from the Tower of London and navigates South America. Can you imagine that? Now next to Richard we have Anne Mark of 1621. Now, when I looked up this year of 1621, Canvey Island in Essex is drained by Dutch engineers for settlement. OK, moving on, we have the chancel itself. So the chancel was completely rebuilt after the earthquake of 1884, and it was funded by the good Reverend Theobald of 1890. Just look at this magnificent chancel arch demonstrating Victorian craftsmanship. Can you just imagine the expense required in this day and age to create something like this? Above we can see one of the angels. Now we look upon the chancel screen. This was carved in 1890 in memory of Philippa Watson, sister to Reverend Watson. Elaborate wood carvings. So I wanted to include these lovely gates. I guess they're iron.
Okay, let's enter the chart cell itself. Again, great credit to the Victorians. Look at this. So we're going to start with this. We've got a second font here. So no information as such, but the cover is Victorian in a tabernacle style. The octagonal rises with tracery and pinnacled buttresses. And if you look at the very top, it was originally hauled up by a counterbalance chain. So if we look next to the font, we have a fine organ, which was donated by Mrs. Nora Forbes in 1919 in com commemoration of the end of World War I. Now, if we look next to that brass plate, we have a music sheet, and this is actually from World War II. It's been literally bonded to the woodwork. And if we have a closer look... October the 15th. 1944. Now Chris has informed me that everything behind uh, in the organ, the, the carcass as such, is riddled with uh, woodworm as such it's got to be removed but the actual front will be left as it is but if you see in front there is an electric organ that's going to be installed in the gap should be interesting to see Okay, we shall now pan around to the high altar area of the chancel. So another uh, future development, if we look at this step here for the chance for the high altar of the chancel, this is going to be lowered to where we're standing now and the altar itself will be lowered right down. Because as you can see, for the clergy, it's quite a safety issue of all these steps at the back. So what we should do now is have a closer look at the floor, because uh, it'd be interesting to see what's uncovered. But you can see the design. I think this is similar to that of Peldon's church. So let's have a look at this fine reredos. This is carved in oak, shows five panels and five angels playing. 
Now they are playing heavenly music based on the work of Fra Angelico, who was born in Tuscany in 1395. Now, unbelievably, there is a portrait of Fra Angelico, but I forgot to bring it, so apologies. If you look at the top of the angel, they have like a, a red, I think it's electricity, where they're connected to heaven, I'm guessing that part. If we look at the base, we can see them standing on a cloud. Clouds. And on the right side. It's just sublime, isn't it? So we have Angel with a drum and brass instrument. And you can tell I'm a big fan of Aridoses and paintings and all things churches. Now look at the east window itself. A lot going on in this. Okay, Chris. So what have we what are we looking at here? Right. This window is again by Harbin, the same as the window we've already seen in the in the nave, um, Harbin and Co of Birmingham. Um, it was uh, installed here after the chancel was rebuilt in 1892. Um, it's an interesting window, I'm told, by um, uh, colleagues who, um, who research uh, saints and what have you, in that it shows East Anglian saints. Um, starting on the left, we have um, St Edmund, King of East Anglia. He's receiving a Danish chieftain, Ragnar Logbrog, I hope I pronounced that right, mm -hmm. who, had landed in the, who had landed on the eastern coast of England. He has hounds by his side and a hawk on his wrist, which denote he had been engaged in hunting. That's next, on the left, is it? That's on the left, yeah. Okay. Right, the next light um, shows the martyrdom of King Edmund, uh, which happened in AD 1870. King Edmund has been defeated in the battle by the Danes, was brought bound to a tree and shot to death with arrows. The emblems of his sovereignty, that is, his crown with an arrow through it, his sword and the royal mantle are lying on the ground. Wow. This St. Edmund, of course, is uh, uh, where the present, uh, is what the present uh, town of Bury St. Edmunds is named after. In the middle, we have um, a standard crucifixion. Christ on the cross with his crown of thorns, um, Mary Magdalene in blue, Pos uh, sorry, uh, Mary, Mary his mother in blue, yeah. um, standing. At the foot of the cross is probably Mary Magdalene um, wearing the red, which she's often donated with, and uh, St. John in green. Oh, okay, so St. John is basically next to Jesus' yeah. mother, yeah. That's right, yeah. Okay. Yes, um, Mary, mother of Jesus, the Virgin Mary, is usually depicted in blue and Mary Magdalene in uh, red. Okay. And then on the right-hand side, the furthest right window... Oh, furthest right, yeah. Yeah, we have um, um, St. Alban receiving the Christian priest Amphib Amphibalus into his house and protecting him from his enemies. Mm -hmm. And then to the left of that, we have the martyrdom of St. Alban, AD 303, in consequence of having befriended Am, uh, Amphipolis, St. Alban was seized by the Roman soldiers and beheaded at Ver Verulam on the banks of the stream. Verulam, of course, being the Latin name for St. Alban. Oh, okay. 
the Latin device SPQR on the Roman standards mounted by an eagle in the background signifies the Senate and the Roman people. Um, looking to the top now, we have, um, uh, we have uh, angels in the um, first two spandrels and above that two more angels. Yeah, I can just about make, oh, okay, yeah. And right at the top we have um, our Lord enthroned in glory. His right hand is raised in an act of blessing and in his left hand he is holding an orb surmounted by a cross signifying, signifying the world subdued to Christianity. Mm. Um, altogether a very fine uh, Victorian window. Hardman windows are not common in this part of Essex. Um, I think we have some on the Tendering Peninsula, but uh, I don't believe we have any in Colchester or any of the villages to the south. Um, another church with Hardman window, Bradfield, which is uh, just outside Manningtree. Thanks, Chris, for your knowledge. Okay. Wow, we can see that Chris really knows his stuff. He um he knows a great knowledge has a great knowledge of stained glass windows. So if you come here, please uh, don't be afraid to ask. Now the other thing that goes on here is Chris will take you up to the tower if he's able to. There you go, they're going for a church tower tour right now. Bye. Okay, while whilst they're all up in the tower, getting a spectacular view, we shall look at this scenery in the corner so this is used to wash um, sacred sacred vessels during mass and it's most likely from the Victorian period when this was built Got a lovely light coming through the window As you can see, I'm easily impressed. Oh, just gone like that. Now oh, it's back again. Love it. So next I'd like to point out the actual lectern. Now this fine eagle lectern is used to, su to support the Holy Bible. The eagle is a symbol of John the Apostle. And I can demonstrate how the Bible will go on to the lectern.
Now, I did a little bit of research, and the lectern dates back to the book of Exodus in the time of Moses, around 13 centuries before Christ. Can you imagine that? The people of Israel referred to it as the Amud, or standing pillar. But it has the same function to speak the word of God. This lectern is in memory of Reverend Theobald of 1886. Okay, so I do not forget, we must cover the Zeppelin. We've got some artefacts here which are most interesting. So this fascinating display here is an account of what happened on the night, but you can actually see that the frame is made from parts of the spar. And here come the tour group. You enjoy that? Yeah, very much. Good? Quite steep steps though. So it's a great read, but it goes into uh, Sergeant Edwards and, and, the, and the, the events of the night. But if we look on the side, the spars, you can see where people have been pinching it, which is shocking, really. You see a section's been removed there. If we go on to this side, we can see also here. I mean, to think that this was actually part of the Zeppelin of that night is incredible, isn't it? So here we have a frame showing the, well, we've got four pictures of the crash site. We've got the infrastructure of L33. Just look at the infrastructure. It's one of the gondoliers and the propeller. You can see in the background the soldiers and the crowd. Can you see that? we go upwards we can see the superstructure with the cottage in the background wow in this picture we have the superstructure that crosses the lane you can see the cottage in the background the last picture shows more of the uh, superstructure the lattice work. And I understand the whole superstructure was taken away by the Navy intelligence, tried to work out how this thing was put together. Now, if we look above the picture frames, we have an actual spar from L33. Now, originally, this was um, over the Chancel Arch in Little Wigborough's church. Okay, I also recommend you have a look at the small book table. It's just besides the... Um, frames. For we have an excellent colour book on St Stephen's Church. We've got the usual postcards and they're obviously selling books uh, to raise funds etc. So it's a good uh, source to get your book. But if you look over here you've also got a pamphlet which I, or booklet, which I highly recommend on the Zeppelin itself. This is definitely a read if you're into First World War history. And also something I saw on the table, which looks good. Um, six footpath walks in and around Tollersbury, which is just down the road. Okay, we shall now make our way to look at the last windows.
Okay, we've made our way to the chancel again, looking at the north window. What can you tell me about this one, Chris? Well, this window um, we have on good authority was made by Charles Clutterbuck. Uh, he was a mid-19th century stained glass artist um, whose studio was in uh, uh, Stratford, um, oh, East, uh, London. East London. Yeah. yeah. Um, very much in a 13th century style. Um, the figurative uh, panels in the middle are typical of uh, Clutterbuck's work. Um, a good example to see such work is at Greenstead Green, um, a little church just outside uh, Halstead. Interestingly, um, one of the first uh, churches built by Sir George Gilbert Scott, mm. who went on to much greater things. Um, it's in memory of uh, a gentleman called Godfrey Bird, who was the uh, son of the then vicar, also called Godfrey Bird. And this window dates from 1857. Um, it's sort of old fashioned. Um, we were at, the t at this time, the Gothic revival was in full swing, although Pugin was dead. Um, there isn't really much uh, sort of Gothic revival about this window. In fact, the figures look very sort of Georgian in their style. Um, more so in the next window we will see. Okay, thank you for that. Okay. So Chris, we're now looking at the south <coughs> window in the chancel. What can you tell me about this one? Well, again, we have this on good authority that this is another Clutterbuck window, but due to the elaborate um, canopy work at the top and the decorative work at the bottom, was mostly uh, made by his son, Charles Clutterbuck, sorry, start again, Charles, Charles. Clutterbuck Jr. It's quite an awkward name, isn't name, it? Yeah. Um, the, oh, okay. uh, the, the central panel is probably the most interesting one. Uh, this shows uh, St. Stephen, the patron saint of this church, being stoned to death. But uh, in the background, you can see that the sky has been painted with enamels where the figures the, the figures bodies and their clothing is made with a uh, colored glass oh. uh, with um, uh, black paint on to show the folds and what have you now the enamel work was very typical of the um, 17th and 18th centuries so it sort of um, substantiate what I was saying about the other window being sort of very old-fashioned. These three panels here look very painterly, very Georgian, very old-fashioned. Nothing like the east window, which we've uh, looked at earlier, which contains virtually no, um, well, no enamel work whatsoever, just um, coloured glass, hot metal glass, in other words, with black paint. So the Clutterbucks were, you could say, still stuck in the 18th century, but obviously their glass was selling. They were still making glass, and um, we're very lucky to have this uh, window here. Um, the chancel we're standing in at the moment was uh, rebuilt in 1892. Sadly, no photographs or prints have come to light to show the what the church looked like pre-earthquake. Um, and I'm not sure whether this square window is a copy of one that was already there or something the architect put in afterwards. Oh, okay, yeah, you yeah. see the square, yeah. Yeah, um, right at the top, you can see that the tracery lights have just got plain glass in. Um, it would suggest that maybe these three um, uh, panels were in separate windows in the chancel. Um, likewise, the dates in the commemoration uh, text at the bottom um, are sort of all over the place. 1869, we've got a date there. Uh, we've got another one of 1873. Again, this suggests that the commemorative text at the bottom um, may have been added after the windows were made and may have come from a, 
it may have been mm. in windows in a, a separate place rather than all three conjoined as we see here but um, nothing else like this in uh, the Colchester area or the southern villages and um, an interesting window in all respects. What can you tell me about the left panel? <clears throat> um, it's, it looks as though it's giving arms. Um, really, it's um, a bit above my pay grade <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> to, uh, yeah. to say what the biblical thing is. But really certainly, sure. if you look in the background, mm. um, on the top right, you can see, again, more enamel work but this time blues and greens to represent the, cloud, uh, the clouds. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's obviously a mother and a child. The child's receiving uh, some bread, but... Just a shame that nothing was written down about down, yeah. the actual meaning yeah. behind it. Um, I say when we next have our respected clergy in here, I'll ask them if they can uh, mm. decipher what they are. And what about on the right panel? The right panel, it's, it's obviously... Um, uh, maybe a king, an emperor, maybe um, one of the Pharisees, wow. I'm not sure, and someone, arms stretched out in front of him, whether or not they're, um, he's receiving a blessing or mm. whether he's um, um, requesting you know, to s save his life or someone else's life, uh, difficult to say, but um, I'm sure people with much greater knowledge of the Bible than me Mm. would um, be able to say exactly what it is. But either way, it's a lovely piece of art, isn't it? And it the, is, uh, yes. The yes, folds yes, of the uh, yeah. clo cloaks and the yeah. colours. Mm. Well, thank you for that. Let's go back a bit. Yeah, look at that. It's stunning, isn't it? Mm. To see it in person, really. Yeah. One other thing to note, on the, the left-hand panel, uh, there's two bits of glass missing. They've um, just replaced it with oh, plain white that, glass, yeah. yeah. That would have been um, similar to the glass which is on the left of the panel. In other words, some more canopy work, the sort of architectural um, work that uh, frames the picture. Well, thank you, Chris. Yeah. So I hope you enjoyed that. Chris really does know his stuff on Windows. So what we're going to do now is we'll go outside and uh, have a look at the features on the outside. So I have been uh, going on a bit longer than normal, but there's so much to cover here. See you, Chris. Okay, thanks again. And uh... yeah. See you. Uh, yeah. So we've made our way outside. Uh, St Stephen's Church has two bells, and unbelievably, it would be the older bell of John Daniel that is still rung to this day. Now, John, John's London foundry cast bells from 1450 to 1470. It's likely that the bell here was named Magdalene, which was transported by boat along the Blackwater estuary. And we'll have a look in a minute at the estuary. It would have been offloaded close by a mile away and, dragon, uh, sorry, and dragged by horse and wagon up the hill to St Stephen's. I also read that John Daniel was also a winemaker, so how about that? Now our second bell is by Miles Gray I of 1622. Now Miles was known as the Prince of Bell Founders. Now Miles attended a court hearing, accepted he was the father of a child with Alice Mullings, a house servant. Now Miles, being an honourable man, married Alice and had three children. So, St Stephen's Church is open for baptisms, weddings and funerals, and I hope you enjoyed that, and thank you very much. <laughs>